so now I should like to give the floor to Professor Capo. Thank you. Can you hear me? Or do I need to use this? Which one do you prefer? The second one. Well, I will put it on my nose. Better? Good. Thanks for this, well, for the invitation and for this introduction, which is a very good summary of the first digital turn, which is good that you did it because I'm not going to talk about that. My topic today is the second digital turn. So you already covered the first. That's it. Let's move to the second one. And parlerò in inglese, anche se è un po' strano, visto che sono nato a 50 km da qui, ma è la mia lingua di lavoro e anche la lingua di ricerca che tutti usiamo per discutere di questi fenomeni, per cui credo che sia meglio usare la versione originale anche se con un accento piuttosto che una traduzione approssimata di termini tecnici per cui non so neanche se esista una traduzione precisa. So I shall continue in English, but do not hesitate to interrupt, interrupt me in Italian or in Piedmontese dialect, <laughs> if necessary, which I still speak with an accent. So my topic today is a simple one. Computers are fascinating tools, but they are machines. So we tend to think that they work like all the other machines we know. They don't. Computers are a new kind of machine. They do not work like any other machine we have ever seen during the modern age and the Industrial Revolution. Computers are post-industrial, post-modern, post-scientific machines. If we use computers to make stuff, physical stuff, stuff made of atoms, not of bits, computers make stuff based on the technical logic, based on a technical logic that is the opposite of that of the industrial age. But, and this is the second digital turn, if you use computers to think, computers think based on a logic that is the opposite of that of modern science. Computers make stuff the way a good artisan workshop could, not the way a modern industrial factory would. And computers calculate and design objects the way a very smart artisan could, not the way any modern engineer would. In short, both as tools to make and as tools to think, computers are closer to the traditional, pre-industrial way of doing things than to the modern, scientific, industrial world as we know it, or knew it, a world that is already falling apart all around us precisely because digital tools have started to destroy all of its technical, social and economic foundations. The reason why digital and industrial manufacturing follow opposite technical logics are well known. The technical logic Yes, it works. Of the industrial world is based on mass production and economies of scale. Most tools of industrial mass production use casts, molds, dies, or other forms of mechanical matrices, like this one. This is a big press today. And this was an old one, the first one, the first printing press, Gutenberg's press used to print books at the end of the Middle Ages. But the logic of printing is still the same. A mechanical matrix, a cast, or a mold, or a die, or a stamp, cost money. And once made, we must use it as many times as we can to spread or amortize its cost over as many identical copies as we possibly can. This is the logic of industrial standardization. 
the more identical copies we make, the cheaper each copy will be. Car making still is based on that logic. This is the logic of the Industrial Revolution, a logic that architects famously ignored or rejected throughout most of the 19th century. It's a famous case and often beyond. One century ago, exactly, Le Corbusier, Gopius, Mies, the Bauhaus were the first to come to term with Fordism and Taylorism, the first to claim that architects should design for industrial mass production. This is a famous comparison by Le Corbusier on the left. Yes, it's the left. The bad guys as the architects, us. We make bad stuff. On the right, the good guys, the engineers. This is what they do. I don't even know what that is, probably a hydroplane or something. But it is meant to indicate engineers are the true interpreters of the modern world. They know how to exploit the logic of mass production, standardization, economies of scale. And this became the foundational myth of modernism in architecture, the story we all studied at school, or people my age did. Let's make all buildings or parts of buildings exactly the same. Let's standardize buildings so we can mass produce them using industrial assembly lines. We can achieve economies of scale and make buildings cheaper. That was Le Corbusier's plan. That logic we now know, with hindsight, was right 100 years ago. It was successful. It did change the history of architecture significantly and the history of the 20th century too. But that logic isn't right today because mechanical mass production worked that way, but digital fabrication doesn't. Why? Because digital fabrication does not use mechanical matrices, casts, or molds, and every piece when digitally made is a one-off. Making more identical copies of the same item will not make any of them cheaper. Making all of them different will not make any of them more expensive. That's the logic of the objectil, which our friend has just epitomized. Standardization using digital tools no longer saves money, and individual variations no longer cost money. Just like 30 years ago, we learned that using a digital laser printer, we could, not print, we could print 100 identical copies of the same page or 100 different pages at the same unit cost. Today we know we can 3D print 100 identical copies of the same chair or 100 different chairs at the same unit cost. In fact, this is what our friends at the Bartlett do. And it is actually impossible to remake this chair identically. Even if you want to make an identical copy, you just can't. Every new copy is a new original. But it will not cost more, because each is a one-off. There is no mechanical matrix of which the cost you would have to amortize. The technical logic and the economic logic is entirely different. Now, all this has a name. The digital mass production of different pieces is called digital mass customization. And the digitally mass produced series of pieces that are all different from one another is called a non-standard series. That also goes back to Bernard Cash in the early 90s. Mass customization, digital craft, the mass production of individual granular, granular variations at no extra cost. This is the general mode, the default mode, so to speak, the most universal technical paradigm of the digital age. These ideas were invented not by engineers, not by technologists, not by philosophers, but by architects. These ideas were invented in a handful of schools of architecture in Europe and in the US in the 90s. This is what Mark Burry was doing around 1996. This was Greg Lynn around year 2000. And to this day, designers 
and the architects are the best specialists of this. Designers and architects, not technologists, not engineers, not sociologists, not philosophers, not economists, not bankers, and certainly not politicians, who to this day do not have the faintest idea of what is going on. So much the worse for them. Let them dig their grave with their own hands, hoping that they will not dig ours at the same time. Because digital mass customization is now spreading like wildfire in all areas and in all aspects of today's life, economy, and culture. Greg Lynn's teapot, made for Alessi, almost 20 years ago, was an experiment. But Fab Lab today, based on the same technical logic, is a social movement. And digital mass customization is moving from production to commerce. With Zipcar, we can digitally customize car rentals. With Airbnb, we can digitally mass customize the rental of real estate. We can rent a room in someone else's apartment for five hours, which until recently was something we could have done as a favor with friends. Like, can I have your apartment this afternoon? Yes, you may. Today, we can actually pay for it. I don't know if it is better or worse, but Mechanical Turk is a way to digitally mass customize the outsourcing of intellectual labor. And for better or worse, Bitcoin is bringing the same logic through the blockchain technology to the banking and finance industry. But there is more than that, because digital mass customization was, and still is, a big deal. But the next big thing may be even bigger. Digital mass customization is what happens when we use computers to make stuff or to buy and sell stuff, production, commerce. And we have been doing that for 20, 30 years now. I call this the first digital turn. But today, more and more, we also use computers for thinking. And this is what I call the second digital turn, or some call it the computational turn. Some call this artificial intelligence, or AI, which is an easy thing to say because nobody knows what artificial intelligence really means today. Example, AI doesn't mean building a computer that moves like a dog or looks like a man, because that's robotics. It's not building a computer that answers your questions, because that's speech recognition. More generally, AI does not mean building a machine that imitates the way we move, speak, or even a machine that imitates the way we think, because this is what Alan Turing famously thought, the Turing test. But that was 70 years ago, mm, even a bit more. Today, to the contrary, if you use computers to think or to solve problems, it is increasingly evident that computers have developed their own way of thinking. And they tend to solve problems in their own way, which is quite different from the way we think and from the way we would try to solve the same problems. That's why we call that intelligence artificial, uh, because it's different from our own natural intelligence, from our own way of thinking. Indeed, the first application of artificial intelligence in design show already that AI is nothing more but nothing less than a new kind of science which we can use to solve all kinds of problems, including problems we couldn't solve in any other way. But it is a science that follows a new method and a new logic, a logic that is no longer ours, which is no longer human, which is probably even a logic any longer. Let me show that with a couple of examples. When we design something, it helps to know in advance that the building we have designed will stand up. 
Traditionally, we used to predict the mechanical behavior and structural resistance of a building using the science of rational mechanics. Uh, this science, which is possibly the most successful of all modern sciences, started with Galileo early in the 17th century. Can you still, is it still working? Does it? Uh, that's better. Should I put it in my nose? One, two. It's probably bad. Let's do it this way. Galileo made plenty of experiments to study the breaking of some beams under some simple load. And he famous published some of his results in his last book, I have the title here in English, of the two new sciences of mechanics and local motion, 1638, but you can read the title in the original, Dimostrazi Discorsi Dimostrazioni Meccaniche intorno a due nuove scienze sulla meccanica e i movimenti locali, if I remember correctly. 1638. Galileo wrote the book in Tuscany, but he couldn't print it in Tuscany because he had some problem with the Inquisition, if you remember. So the book was planted, printed in Leiden, which is now in Holland, and it was then in the Republic of United Protestant Provinces, a Protestant countries. So the story is well known. The manuscript of Galileo's book left Tuscany in the diplomatic case of the ambassadors of the Republic of United Provinces, i.e. Holland, with the Grand Duke of Tuscany. And the book was printed in Holland and distributed and circulated around the world. But Galileo could never see it because all Galileo's books were in the index of prohibited books. And so if they were brought to Tuscany, they would be burnt together with the person reading them. So Galileo never saw his book printed. But the book was printed, and it did change the history of science. And the history of engineering, this is the beginning of what we still study in engineering today. But today, we need not repeat any of Galileo's experiments, nor any other experiment, to determine how most beams will break, because generalizing from Galileo's experiments and from many more that followed, we have obtained some very general formulas that predict the structural behavior of most standard beams under most standard loads. These formulas that engineering students learn in two weeks and then remember for life or, remember or forget in two days, describe in a few clean lines of mathematical script all the beams that broke in the past and all that will break in the future in certain given conditions. This is modern science. This is how modern science worked till now. Because let's put ourselves in a computational frame of mind. And let's assume, again pushing the argument to the limit, that all life events, so to speak, occurring to any structure ever built can be recorded in full from design and construction to collapse or destruction. Then, let's assume that this universal archive of the life and death of all structures ever built can be kept forever and searched or googled at will. In that case, the best way to design a new beam would be not to calculate it with the formulas we studied at school, but instead to search for the record of a very similar one that was built in the past and replicate that design when we know it will do what we need. Thus, a simple search would replace all predictive science, and we could design the safest possible structure based on the evidence of actual precedent without any engineering calculation. No science, no maths, nothing. Just retrieval. No science, just Google. Don't calculate, search. 
Does that sound like a practical joke? It shouldn't, because this is what we have been doing for a few years already, thanks to the powers of today computation, only in a slightly different way, and often without saying it too loud. You may have seen this structure, that's Akim Menges, he built it a few years ago in Stuttgart. And how do you think this structure was calculated before it was built? Because it was calculated, it is built in a public space, this is Germany, so before you can build it in a public space you need to prove to the local office for something that when it snows and there is wind it will stand up. So we have to prove with calculations on paper, they have to be certified and rubber stamped by local office for whatever. So we have to submit engineering calculation to obtain the approval, permission to build. How is it calculated? Using this kind of science? No, that would have been impossible because this is the science we studied at school, and to the limit, well, a filament cannot be calculated that way because it's, it's not a rigid structure, but to the limit, using an advanced version of this science, we could calculate each one of the filaments in that structure, but there are four million filaments in that structure and counting. So if you want to calculate each filament, it would take forever. That would have been impossible. In fact, that structure was not really calculated that way. Instead, its designers looked for a historical precedent, which, when built, stood up. And when they found it, they replicated it, thinking that as it stood up before, it would stand up again. Now, that structure, as you may have noticed, is new and original and unusual. So if you look for a real precedent, built in real life, chances are you will not find one. In fact, the precedent they found was not a real building, it was simulated using finite element analysis. In fact, using the immense powers of today computation, the designer simulated not just one, but many similar structures. And they tested all of them on the screen. In a sense, they broke them on the screen in simulation, and they kept breaking them until they found one that on the screen did not break. And that was the good one, the one they built. This, as you may notice, and I go back to my original, uh, the point where I started, is not different from what a traditional artisan would have done. Artisans, I mean real artisans, days gone by, as well as the timeless artisan recently romanticized by Richard Sennett. They were not engineers, so they didn't use maths to predict the structural behavior of the stuff they made. When they were good, they learned by experience, by trial and error. You make a chair, and if it breaks, you make another, slightly different, and then another, and then another, until you make one that doesn't break. And if you are a smart artisan and you make three different chairs and they all break in the same way, you may try to figure out what went wrong with all of them. And by intuition, not by calculation, you may try something else when you make your next chair so it won't break so easily. This is exactly what we do today using digital simulations with one difference. With computers, today, we can make and break on the screen in a few minutes more chairs than a traditional artisan would have made and broken in a lifetime. Hence, hopefully, we can more easily learn something in the process. But even if we are very dumb and we don't, breaking plenty of digital models in simulation on a screen costs very little almost nothing. So even if we are not lucky and we do not hit the jackpot right away and the results we are looking for do not show up, we can keep tweaking and breaking digital models on the screen 
for as long as it takes, because it costs nothing. Well, one may object that this process might still take quite a lot of time, and that's true. A random trial and error process may take, in theory, forever, which is why at some point we invented a scientific method, because we wanted something faster. But in this instance, we have another card to play. We have trained computers to make and break, instead of us, automatically. We call this optimization. And we have plenty of software to do that, such as, for example, uh, Galapagos, a uh, grasshopper plugin that most of our students at the Bartlett use, written by a young Austrian scientist called David Rotten, and as he explains, evolutionary algorithms, which, by the way, were invented in 1975, so it's not a recent thing, they are little more than unimaginably massive trial and error routines, where at some point, some random trials start to turn out areas or patches of better results. So the software automatically refocuses on those areas, targets those values, and drops the other ones, and starts a new run of trials limited to the values that appear more promising, and so on and so on ad infinitum, or for as long as it takes, or until we are pleased with the results, or we run out of time and someone pulls the plug. No human would calculate anything that way because it would take forever and because it seems a bit dumb. But computers can do so many trials so fast that using advanced computation, massive trial and error becomes a viable computational strategy. Actually, it becomes the best computational strategy. Because if we look under the hood, if we look beyond all the glitz and flash, that's the only thing computers really do. Massive trial and error. This is what some call a new kind of science, but you may understand from my argument, but we might as well call it a very old kind of science. Except today with computers, it becomes practically feasible. Without computers, it's not very practical, it's not very feasible, because it takes forever, and we can never tell how long it will take until we get to usable results. With computers, it's a completely different story. Trial and error, which is a very dumb strategy for us, it is a very smart strategy for them, because we are slow and because we are fast. We call it simulation and optimization. Some see it as a new form of heuristics. Trial and error, that's what it means. Based on generative evolutionary algorithms or simply as banal but massive computational trial and error. Similar post-scientific methods also used to be called the new science of emergence, self-organized system, or form finding. And similar postmodern theories of complexity also inspired the discrete mathematics of cellular automata and agent-based systems. Today, computer scientists prefer to speak of big data or machine learning or deep learning or artificial neural networks. And the consensus seems to be that all of these can already be called evidently artificial intelligence. But in fact, we might as well call it the new science of Google. Search, don't sort. This, in my opinion, this Google tagline, which is used for the launch of Gmail in 2004, is to date the best definition or of artificial intelligence, because it explains in three words the difference between what computers do, that's artificial intelligence, and what we do, that's natural intelligence. We sort, computers search. 
This was indeed the spirit of the game when Google first launched Gmail in 2004. And some in this room may be old enough to remember what the tagline meant back then when Gmail was launched as a revolutionary novelty. Before Gmail, meaning before 2004, email messages were resident files archived on the hard disk of our small desktop computers. And the search function on those disks, if anyone here remembers those distant times, were so slow and ineffective that we could not really search our own email archive. And the only way to retrieve messages was to sort them, keeping them in folders, each folder with a name and a title. You may see on the screen with this romantic, pathetic instruction from 1996, which is 22 years ago. We did not, is it, 96? Uh, yes, yes. We did not complain back then, evidently, because we thought that was a very normal and natural thing to do. Because this is what humans always did since the beginning of time. We put things in certain places so we know where things are when we look for them. And incidentally, by doing so, we humans also sort, classify, and organize facts and data, which may help us to make some sense of the world, even. But this is exactly what Google, or Gmail, told us we should stop doing, because Google's computers can search any random database so fast that we don't even have to try to sort it anymore. These are instructions for 2006, so 10 years later, when Gmail was new and people were still learning the logic and the spirit of the game. Search, don't sort. We were used to sorting, and we realized that we didn't have to do it anymore because Google can search faster than we can sort. That's what that formula meant back then. Stop sorting your messages. Just keep them all randomly, in the row, just as they come. And when you look for one, just Google your archive for the right combination of keywords and names and dates. Most of the time you will find what you're looking for. And that's the magic of it. You will find it without even knowing where it is. And that's actually true and it works because who in these rooms is still using folders to sort email messages? Question. Is anyone still using folders? Who? Really? Yes, you can use labels. Labels. Yes, you can use labels. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you're not systematically using folders. You're just using labels as needed. That's, that's what I do, yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I myself used to do it, and then I stopped doing it when I realized that Google could do it faster than I would. Because computers can now search faster than we sort. But it is disquieting because, well, I have sometimes ask this question to my students that they don't, real, they don't even realize what I'm asking because they don't really know, they don't even know anymore what sorting means. Sorting, what do you mean? So, now this doesn't only happen in data space. This is already happening in physical space too. Think of books in a library, a big library. Librarians put books on shelves following a number of system of universal classification of everything. So if you look for a book on example, Renaissance architecture, churches, Florence, 15th century, that translates into a formula, the call number or the shelf number, that will lead us to the shelf where that book is without having to read all the titles of all the books on all the shelves. But that's the old way, new way. Bring in Google and the post-human science of searching. Fire all the librarians. Just eliminate the profession of a librarian. Just gone. Whenever a book comes in, you tag it with an RF 
ID chip, which is like a barcode, but when it can be read electronically from a distance. It used to be expensive, now they cost pennies. So they can actually put it on every piece of random document. Then, when you've tagged them with one of those chips, you put all the books in a huge pile at random, at a mountain, and you leave them there. When you look for a book, you wear a pair of augmented reality glasses, like this one, and you say, OK, Google, where is that book? And you scan the mountain of the books, and you will see the book you're looking for flashing red in your field of vision. Google doesn't need librarians because it can find a book by computational search much faster than any librarian would by human sorting and retrieval. Google can search so well that we do not need to sort anymore, which is, of course, what Amazon is already doing. That's an Amazon warehouse. No human could find anything there, and that's OK, because that's not made for humans. It is made for computational search and robotic retrieval. There is not even electric light in that warehouse, because no human being will ever go in it. Now, you may remember one generation ago in the 90s when complexity sciences started to emerge. It was a joke, which I remember, a dialogue between a modernist philosopher and a postmodernist philosopher. And the modernist philosopher says, complexity is what we do not understand. And the postmodernist answer, you do not understand complexity. Today, complexity is just a practical tool. It's what humans can sort, but computers can search. It's not philosophy. Don't tell Gilles Deleuze, it's dead anyway. It's just technology. Now, as it happens, and here philosophy comes back into the picture, the entire method of modern experimental science, the science we studied at school, the science of Galileo and Newton, was all based on sorting. Like Galileo and Newton, you used to compare and select facts and figures, generalize and formalize our findings, and then extract abstract from a huge collection of data, some simple, memorable, abstract and general formulas or laws, mathematical laws like these ones, for example. These are the formulas we use and need to predict future events. But this is precisely what computers don't need, because this is what computers don't do. Instead, the new science of computational searching means Keep all the data you can find in the row as they come. Store them forever, which is increasingly possible at a very little cost, almost nothing. And when you design something new, look for a precedent. Chances are you will find it and replicate it. Most of the time, the precedent is not actually a real precedent. It's simulated, but the logic is the same. When we design this way, we do not calculate nor deduct anything any longer. We just search, simulate, and search. When we think this way, all the science we studied at school is gone. Computation has replaced it and made it obsolete. Now, evidently, this is a design method that no engineer today would endorse or approve or even like. In fact, I'm not certain I like it myself. In traditional scientific terms, this mode of design is just plain dumb. Because if we design this way, evidently, we do not use any science to design. Think of what we didn't do. The traditional formulas of structural engineering establish causal relationships relationship of cause to effect between loads, forms, stresses, and deformation of the materials. By the causality they express, these formulas interpret and provide some understanding of the physical phenomena they describe. They have a meaning which we think is true to nature. Indeed, this meaningfulness is visible in all the masterpieces of modern structural engineering, from Eiffel's Tower to Nervis Volts. If we look at this 
modern structures. We understand the basic structural ideas that designers had in mind when they first sketched them. But we didn't use any of that to build this structure, for example. So when we look at it, we do not have the faintest idea of how and why it stands up. Why does this structure stand up and the thousands we just tried and discarded in simulation didn't? Nobody knows it. Least of all, it's designers. And yet, it does stand up. Using digital simulation, we know in advance it will, which is why we can build it. Using simulation, optimization, cellular automata, and agent-based system, artificial intelligence today can already predict things that modern science cannot explain and our mind cannot understand. In some cases, computers can already tell us what is going to happen, but they won't tell us why, because computers don't do that. In the example of a library, as I just mentioned, artificial intelligence is the new art of finding things without knowing where they are. In engineering, artificial intelligence is the new art of finding good solutions without knowing why they work. Prediction without causation is prediction without explanation. Until recently, that would have been seen as black magic, which some people liked uh, over time, and some people still do, and some don't. But today, whether we like it or not, that's just the way artificial intelligence works. That's the way computers work and the way we must let them work if we want to take advantage of their power. But after this vote on confidence, let me also add, to conclude, a note of caution. Yes, computers work that way. What many call AI or artificial intelligence today, or machine learning, or deep learning, or simulation, or optimization, means simply massive computational trial and error. By trial and trying, by trying and trying again, and incrementally refocusing their trials over time, computers can already solve problems better and faster than we could in any other way. But if computers think that way, that doesn't mean that we humans should imitate computers and think that way too. When performed by humans, trial and error is a very dumb strategy. Pre-industrial, pre-scientific artisan did work that way, then the science of modern engineering came. Engineering is smarter than trial and error because using mathematical calculations, we can predict the behavior of a structure before it is built, so we can avoid many costly trials and many costly errors. Which is why, over time, we came to trust engineers more than artisans. And engineering replaced craft. But today, this process is going into reverse, because the best and most effective of today's computational tools work and think like artisans, not like engineers, not like normal artisans, but like uber artisans, artisans empowered by the speed of digital computation. Computers can think and work that way because they are dumb, but they are fast. To the contrary, we humans, we may be less dumb, perhaps, but we are slow. Our mind is hardwired for small data, not for big data. We cannot compute with computers on processing speed, which is why we invented science, to compress experience into formulas, formulas made to measure for our mind, formulas we can understand and keep in our memory, formulas we use and need to make sense of the world. We humans always work that way. And in my opinion, that is not going to change anytime soon. And this is my last words for the day. Thank you. This is Luma Piemontese. Okay, so uh, we have uh, the question. Uh, I would like to start just underlining the uh, properties of those uh, uh, tools. Uh, um, I'm now working in a thesis with a series of other uh, professors uh, 
ingenious uh, architect and so on. And we are working exactly on form finding a uh, uh, shape uh, using a multi criteria analysis. So I would like just to underline that uh, this algorithm are not only a tool, but also a way of dialogue, dialoguing between different disciplines. Because in ah. that way, we are not like in the traditional way, I design a shape, but then I go to the engineer and uh, say, oh, okay, maybe not. But then we go to the acoustic, and then we go to the. Uh, indeed, we are only describing and deciding the boundaries of the possible development of the shape. Each, uh, each one is defining his own boundaries, and then the project is uh, the common, the common land inside all the different boundaries. So there is a superimposition, and the algorithm is what really links uh, all the. Yeah, boundaries. and what you're saying, this pertains to the sociology of science, in a sense, with a great, a famous Bruno Latour argument. This algorithms, but the same would apply to traditional scientific formulas. They are platform for the interchange of um, competences between disciplines. This is the way we communicate with one another. But in this sense, the algorithm you are describing, they are not different from the science we knew. This is the way we communicate humans. I communicate with you, you communicate with someone else. This is the platform used to exchange ideas. But this is not the way we communicate with machines. This is not the way machines communicate between or amongst them. So dialogue is what we humans do. There was a time at the beginning of cybernetics in the 60s and the early 70s when we thought or they thought that dialogue was the way to communicate with the machines. In the early 70s, Nicolas Negroponte started that way. That was the legacy of cybernetics. Since at the time they knew that artificial intelligence couldn't work with machines alone, because machines didn't have the power to do basically anything, they thought that humans should mentor artificial intelligence or the electronic brains by dialogue. And so the age of cybernetics with the myth of feedback and interaction was the idea that since artificial intelligence and algorithms by themselves, they will go nowhere. We should mentor the machine with permanent human interaction. So the computers becomes the universal assistant of a designer, for example. That was Negroponte's great idea of 1970, the architecture machine. The dialogue, the architects and the machine, com they are complementary in a sense. But that was an early stage in cybernetic, and we are not doing that anymore because it didn't work. Uh, soon enough, they found out that that's not the way to communicate with machines. It was that program was in fact abandoned because it never produced any results. And that idea of artificial intelligence as a dialogue-based interaction between the human and the machine was abandoned pretty soon because you remember from Negroponte's book, the standard answer that the machine gave to the, on the screen was too much information or I don't get it or something like that. So after a while, and that project failed and artificial intelligence with that cybernetic feedback-based approach was abandoned until a few years ago. We realized that machines, by working their own way, without any interaction, by developing their own data-based expertise, could produce actually usable results. This is the revival of artificial intelligence, or artificial intelligence 2.0. We still interpret it with a conceptual framework we inherited from the 60s and 70s, because that's the way we were trained. That's the philosophy we knew. But the technical phenomenon we are working with is of a completely different nature. It's a different beast. Today's computers do not want to dialogue with us. They want to work by themselves, because the amount of data they manage, the database, data mining or data searching, the main effort we make is to produce interfaces to visualize this wealth of data, to make some sense to us. And you know why? That's per perfectly useless, because we don't need that data. It is too much for us. The only entity that can do something with that data is the machine itself. That wealth of data has already vastly overstepped the amount of what we can rationalize. It's not for us, it's for them. There are two strategies. Small data is for us. 
big data is for them. And the interface is hopeless, because if we, if we try to translate, it's too much for us, it's not enough for them. So dialogue, we still need it as humans, but not to converse with the machine. Yeah, I'm saying that uh, indeed we are not uh, having a direct dialogue. Our dialogue is indeed uh, the definition of boundaries, but all independent boundaries. Yeah. We give them a series of multiple And it still applies to the, to the sociology of science. Bruno Latour's description still applies because sociology well, yeah. he would want to extend it even to the machines, because he thinks that machines and humans work, network in the same way, but it's not true anymore. That was probably true 20 years ago, when the ant theory was, the, the actor network theory was developed. But with today's machine, Latour's sociological approach is, I mean, it doesn't work anymore. Don't tell Albina. <laughs> They're already ruins. They're already in the ruin stage. Yeah. <laughs> That's possible, yes. <laughs> yeah, and so, uh, as, as you talked about predictability, so do you think that the next turn might take care of the ruins of the, of the, the present, the second turn? <laughs> well, that's a never ending story. <laughs> Fortunately, one of the advantages and the fascination of history is that it always changes. So. The future of today is the past of tomorrow, or something like that. But concerning the first and the second digital term, we have already the possibility to take into account a vast amount of ruins which are still being produced, because the first digital term did produce an architectural style, the style which is called parametricism, the style of the spline of digital streamlining, which is still being built. I mean. Zadid's office, Patrick Schumacher, were still building that way. And it is, technically and culturally speaking, something which, as a historian, I could precisely situate between 1993 and 1998. But of course, back then, with those conceptual tools and with the technology of the time, we could make a teapot. And I remember when Greg Lee made a teapot in 2000, 2001, everyone said, Building is not a teapot. A teapot is not scalable. And everyone laughed. But now that teapot has grown. I mean, Patrick Schumacher is building teapots in the size of skyscrapers. Nobody's laughing anymore. 
But, you know, what always happens, architecture is a technical discipline, so between the concept and the idea and the maturity of an idea and the technical possibility to implement it, there is a long delay. And so what is being built now is the monster of Dr. Frankenstein of the technical imagination of 15 or 20 years ago. That's inevitable. But critically and historically, we have the duty to say what you're building now is conceptually and technically old. That's something that made sense 20 years ago. Because computers, even computers today, do not work that way anymore. So yes, we are putting the 90s in a museum as they should be, because the 90s are 20 years old. The cycle of historical change is, is, is evident. So I don't see a problem with that. I mean, it happens all the time. The 90s, did it be the 80s? No, they didn't. They did it in the 60s. And the 70s, did it in the 50s? Perhaps today it's a bit faster, possibly in internet time. So the cycle of putting things in a museum is probably faster than it used to be. Now, people I knew when I was a student, no name mentioned, are now traveling around the world telling what they did when they were young. Alberti had to wait for much longer before he could do that. This is a question which often occurs in this discussion because it is normal that people may be worried about the imminent disappearance of our profession. So if I were a taxi driver, I would be worried that profession is disappearing. Um, if I were a structural engineer, I would be worried because structural optimization is already made in some of run-of-the-mill work of a structural engineer perfectly obsolete. Not the good engineers, but you know, the bland structural engineering, now software can do that. I don't think our own training is particularly at stake. The practical answer is that we are so cheap and computers are still so expensive, but it still doesn't make any economic sense to replace us with a computer which is more expensive than we are. But that's the practical explanation. So don't worry, that is not going to change for the duration of your lifetime, most likely. But also, the way this technology works, we are in discussing optimization. Computers are very good at optimizing, but they can only optimize what we tell them to optimize. That choice is still the designer's choice. By definition, you cannot optimize everything at the same time. Even Leibniz didn't think that was possible. Well, actually, he thought that was possible, but that was his own little problem. Technically, when we optimize something, you must choose which parameters to optimize to the detriment of other parameters that you decide to neglect. This is a fundamental design choice, which we always made. We made it unconsciously, we made it intuitively, and now we can make it technically because when we decide to optimize something, there is a machine that can do it fast and well. But this is what we always did. And we know that we cannot optimize everything at the same time. That is the designer's choice. This is not going to change. The speed of optimization is probably performing better today than it did 20 years ago. But the choice, the responsibility of the designer, you must choose. You want to make that bridge lighter or cheaper or more elegant, that's still our crucial design decision. It is the designer, it is also a social, political, cultural decision. We interpret these decisions which are made by our commissioners, by our committee, by our client, by a society at large. The fundamentals of our jobs have not changed. The fact that there is a machine that when we decide to optimize something can do it, it doesn't change the spirit of the game. Uh, 
I can answer right away. There are discussions. Do we, you may have noticed, but some areas of the traditional mathematical curriculum have already been abolished. Who has studied logarithms in this? Did you, who has studied logarithms? You did? Rats. For how long? Two days? I still had three months of logarithms in high school. But, well, the principle, the principle of logarithms, to know how to notate a logarithm is still probably useful. But as a tool of calculation, for, for us it was a few months of training because we actually still needed them because if you needed to operate with big numbers, there was nothing else. So you still need logarithmic tables in print. And, um, but some are arguing that the sp space of calculus in the mathematical curriculum should be shrunk. Because if you think of it, in all the mathematical curriculum around the world, or at least in the West, for what I know, all that we do from the age of six to the age of 18 is aimed at making us capable of calculating derivatives and integrals at the age of 18. It's all, it's all a progression. You start from first grade till baccalaureate or la maturita. The idea is at the age of 18, you can drive a car in Europe, you can vote, and you can calculate derivatives. That's the apex, the culmination of classical mathematics. But there are already suggestions among mathematicians that more space should be given to statistic and uh, the algorithm of searching, which is the logic of computation, and that, of course, we still need, you know, derivatives is about finding maxima and minima, which computational tools can already do by trial and error without any need to infer mathematical functions. That's the way they do, and they do it better than we would using the traditional mathematical notations. So it is already a case that all the mathematics we study, which was aimed at making us capable of describing and calculating big numbers, is to some extent obsolete. And it has probably have to be rebooted to take into account the fact that computers can do much faster and better by using a logic which doesn't need that much of that mathematics. You had another question, however. Yeah. Uh, do you think that we are uh, or we are ready to pass the, through a shift from knowledge with the traditional paradigm of correspondence between uh, a belief in my mind and a fact in the world outside, in the external world, to a kind of a proxy knowledge with uh, a paradigm, the paradigm of, of the simulation? And simulation is uh, neither uh, in my mind nor, let's say, uh, in the external world. It's in a kind of, uh, in the art, in, a, in an artifact, in, a, uh, in an interface between the inner and the outer. You know, there is a lot of philosophical and metaphysical physical speculation on the notion of simulation because it has this humanistic, you know, implications starting with Baudrillard, et cetera, uh, simulacre, simula simulation, et cetera. But if you speak to a mathematician, which I am not, but this is what mathematicians tell me, simulation is just one alternative way to solve a certain class of mathematical problems. Either you can write them down, the traditional way we did, by writing a formula, which you can calculate with derivatives, et cetera, et cetera, or well, if you can describe a phenomenon with a formula, if you have a formula, which is a function, then you can optimize it by having maxima and minima. But if you, don't, if you cannot describe a physical phenomenon with a formula, you can just try and try and try. Each trial is a simulation. A huge number of trials is massive simulation. And then you have a number of results, and among these many results, you can choose some which are good enough. The difference is the traditional way, the mathematical way, you have the best result, the maximum or the minimum. In the simulation way, which is massive computational trial and error, you never have the certainty that a certain result is the best. You only have a result which is good enough 
or as good as it gets, as it gets. Because some people say, but there is a convergence. If you build a convergence, you're building a mathematical function again, which is exactly what you should not do. So pure, massive, heuristic trial and error, just you keep trying and trying and trying. There is a way of computational scientists call it hill building. You build a graph which has more or less a peak, but you never know precisely where the peak of the peak is because it's discrete. Every trial is different. And you have a result which you think is close to the peak, but you never know that another one, which is one inch on the right, might be a little bit better. You never know. That's the difference between mathematics, optimization, the maximum and the mean, or simulation. Massive heuristic trial and error, which is the way computers solve problems for which we do not have a mathematical description, which is why that strategy is sometimes smart, but sometimes it is the only possible strategy, because there are phenomena which we cannot model, but which you can simulate by trying and trying and trying. At some point, you will find some results which are good enough. That's the spirit. That's what they do. Well, we could do it ourselves if we had an unlimited amount of time, which we do not have, which is why we don't do it. Apparently, very, very far away, but let's start from the first one uh, that relates to architecture. And to that, I would like to switch to Italian in order to, to, to touch Please. the point uh, closely. Uh, L'architettura è, è tante cose. Io non, non voglio considerare dell'architettura sotto tutte le sue definizioni, ma anche un aspetto specifico che è l'housing. E esiste da almeno, da almeno 800 Stati Uniti, un sistema che è anteriore a fare mente con l'audio, che sono i cataloghi, I cataloghi. le case sì, catalogo. Sì, sì, sì. E le case catalogo non sono nate, eh, va bene, allora quello era medium, nel senso che era un catalogo cartaceo, quindi arrivava la casa, e compravo la casa catalogo. Ma non è solo il medium che mi vincola, ma è proprio i produttori che dall'Ottocento sono stati sistemi di industrializzazione estremamente avanzati. Sì, il catalogo della casa era un balloon frame che era parametricamente questo. Mm -hmm. eh, Quindi esiste un sistema di catalogo con sistemi di industrializzazione estremamente sofisticati negli Stati Uniti. Sono stati sviluppati centinaia di sistemi. E i produttori alla fine hanno deciso di convergere su un numero di soluzioni limitate perché la gente era più facilitata a scegliere nel discreto che nel cortile. Cioè, era più facile. Per io che compro casa, io famiglia americana di quattro persone, mi è più facile comprarla sul catalogo. Girando la questione, il Balloon Frame, come lei considerava, è sostanzialmente un sistema indefinitamente, indefinitamente flessibile. Ha un solo vincolo che è l'altezza per il cambiamento. Però se noi guardiamo la variabilità reale del, del sistema Balloon Frame, esistono decine di pubblicazioni che considerano la variabilità. La variabilità è piccolissima. I, le tipologie costruite col sistema Confre sono poche e questo è anche evidente visitando il Congress of Worlds degli Stati Uniti. Quindi, perché un sistema che è infinitamente flessibile è, alla fine ha prodotto de, delle tipologie costruttive che sono, delle tipologie ripetitive che sono in definitiva molto poche. Io su questo la pongo come questione, però aggiungo una nota che secondo me sta eh, citando Moneo, Moneo in, 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 un suo, in un suo paper sostiene la lentezza dell'innovazione nei PIN. Cioè mm -hmm. l'innovazione tipologica, come la chiamano qui, è molto lenta e quindi l'emergere di nuovi tipi va sulle scale più dei secoli che dei decenni. Quindi, io credo che ci sia un distinguo forte da fare tra design, industrial design, il prodotto e l'architettura. Poi l'architettura appunto, l'architettura sono tante cose, io qui ho considerato il lato, quindi that's the first part. Per il secondo lato, let's consider it later on. Eh, L'argomento, la questione che pone lei, la differenza fra il continuo e il discreto è un argomento che ricorre frequente nel, nel computational. 
eh, Bernard Cascia mi ha insegnato qui, credo che qualche Io anno fa, bene, ah, ah, ah. quindi un suo argomento tipico, è un mio vecchio amico, è con una penna BIC come questa, Um, che è un modello standard prodotto, ci sono quattro tipi di penna BIC e prodotti in migliaia di, di, di copie identiche. Um, usando tecnologie come quelle che Bernard ha sviluppato, è possibile con un 3D printer e un file customizzare eh, il disegno di questa penna BIC, per cui potrei ogni volta stamparmene una in casa leggermente diversa. Ma perché dovrei farlo, visto che questa penna BIC, in le sue quattro versioni, soddisfa in fondo ogni esigenza e ogni necessità di fare una penna? Quindi queste variazioni cosmetiche, stampare una penna col becco di paperino, un'altra con le orecchie di topolino, si potrebbe fare, ma è anche moralmente sbagliato, perché non ci sono più di quattro penne di cui avremmo bisogno. Reciprocamente... Qualcuno potrebbe dire che uno stesso tipo abitativo serve per l'intera popolazione umana, alcuni modernisti lo pensavano, o forse 10 modelli, o forse 50, o 60, Neufert li avrebbe ridotti a qualche centinaio, è una questione ideologica più che una questione pratica. Avrà notato che io prendo i miei esempi da un campo dell'ingegneria dell strutturale dove la questione è puramente tecnica, non ci sono implicazioni sociologiche. Quindi lei potrà avere un modello, un building type, che è giustificato da motivazioni storiche, sociologiche, che, o qualunque, però poi un ingegnere dovrà trovare la maniera la più efficace, la più performante di farla stare in piedi. E lì ehm, gli argomenti che io presento, che sono tutti instrumental and not intentional, si applicano più facilmente perché sono questioni puramente quantificabili. Nel campo, nel campo che ha citato lei probabilmente non esiste, non è mai esistito e non esisterà mai nessun motivo di avere una seamless mass customization perché non esiste nessun motivo per cui eh, dovendo fare, non so, 90 lav lav lavandini da cucina non, non ci, non, probabilmente non devono essere tutti e 90 diversi, probabilmente farne 5 soddisfa il 99% dei casi, quindi Digital Mass Customization è un principio di logica tecnica ed economica, poi è il nostro problema di design è capire in quali campi è giustificato e in quali è superfluo. Nella maggior parte delle applicazioni del disegno del, del problema dello housing è probabilmente perfettamente superfluo, perché sono anch'io d'accordo che esista un numero limitato di building types che per quanto riguarda il social housing in un particolare momento, eh, in un particolare luogo, non ce ne sono bisogno di più di tanti. Per cui l'idea che era quella di Greg Lynn, dopo che ha fatto la, mh, la sua tipot, ne ha fatto un modello più grande, la embryologic house, l'idea che seamless digital mass customization permetta ad ogni cliente di disegnare una casa che è infinitamente, infinitisamente diversa da qualsiasi altra casa. Ma qualcuno avrebbe potuto dire, e qualcuno ha detto, a qua bon, a che serve? Visto che in definitiva non ci servono più di tanti modelli di case. Anche l'idea che quando fa l'auto non è che sia... Cioè, non è, che è, sia è vero che, no, ci sono poi differenze, come dire, pratiche sociologiche. Se lei considera che negli Stati Uniti ogni casa è costruita su una parcelle indipendente, delle variazioni sono più legittime che in un contesto di social housing europeo dove si impilano 250 alloggi che devono essere tutti uguali perché sono costruiti uno sull'altro, per cui qui queste sono differenze eh, culturali, ma evidentemente nel caso che cita lei, building types and social housing, seamless digital mass customization non sarà probabilmente mai richiesto. Se lei invece poi mi dice... Um, c'è un, un, un elemento prefabbricato per questo motivo di finestra, per questo motivo di curtain wall, lì possiamo parlarne, perché è un problema ingegneristico, dove in termini ingegneristici si può provare che non esiste nessun motivo per ripetere la stessa finestra 250.000 volte identico, perché ad ogni piano deve essere leggermente diversa, perché l'inclinazione del sole è diverso, lì se ne può riparlare. Esistono mm. a New York, sì. ci sono parecchi. Sì. The second part. Okay. Uh, più la seconda fatalità di sociale in inverno. È ben nota la questione del, del gorilla che deve battere quanto tempo impiegherà a scrivere le cicloti del Vulcano. C'è un'altra versione, sì, è stata calcolata in miliardi di anni, c'è un'altra versione meno nota di quanto il gorilla ci può mettere, eh, chiuso in, in un magazzino della Boeing, a montare un Boeing 747, anche lì va nell'ordine, non mi ricordo, eh, ma va, va, va nei migliori 
nell'ordine dei migliori migliaia di piastre. Eh, io però vorrei aggiungere una questione perché l'intelligenza artificiale è un settore vasto e anche molto inclusivo, citando un laboratorio, che è quello di Tommaso Poggio a MIT, lui ha un istituto for brain research, ma lui ha iniziato eh, di Genova, poi vabbè comunque, eh, ha iniziato su, sulla bici e c'è un suo teorema che è poco noto fuori dal contesto specifico della televisione artificiale che secondo me però è illuminante dove sta andando l'intelligenza artificiale profonda c'è un'intelligenza artificiale commerciale it is the product we may have today e c'è una ricerca di lungo termine e io credo che Tommaso Foggio sia uno dei, degli esponenti profondi di questa ricerca lui mostra che la visione è un il posed problem e la definizione di il posed problem è molto specifica ed è una definizione di problemi mal posti in fisica i problemi mal posti in fisica quindi mostra che sono risolvibili in tre modi ma quello che è interessante per la visione artificiale è che la, è un problema risolvibile con conoscenza a priori questo è un esempio che è ma la visione io la risolvo sapendo già prima che cosa vedo uh -huh. e l'esempio illuminante è il seguente qualsiasi essere umano non penserebbe mai in nessun momento che qui non c'è un pezzo di vita cioè, stiamo vedendo due vite tutti noi conosciamo il vita e quindi nessuno immaginerebbe mai che qui possa mancare no? una cosa alla esce una macchina. una macchina in questo senso non avrà mai questa evidenza a meno che la macchina impari ah, machine eh, learning esattamente quello che stanno facendo gli stanno dando la conoscenza del mondo in modo da andare oltre questo problema banale no? dell'incrocio del vita, in modo che la macchina abbia una conoscenza del mondo che vede tale da saper interpretare il fatto che non sono due pezzi di dito ma è un dito unico o quel fatto che è dito unico quindi gli stanno dando quindi è la costruzione del knowledge in termini computazionali in modo che problemi cognitivi elevati come la visione diventino risolvibili. Questa è la traiettoria di un termine, ma non ci sono lontanissimi, nel senso che molti problemi militari che eh sì, sono, sono, già, sono, risolti, sono già risolti, sono risolti. Sì, sì. Diciamo, con, sono con machine learning. Le nuove intelligenze mm. sganciano loro, sì. sganciano i loro sistemi. Perché? Quindi, allora, l'intelligenza artificiale è tante cose, ma lì è dove sta andando, probabilmente non avremo un prodotto nei prossimi sei mesi o sei anni, ma sicuramente risolverà problemi di conoscenza profonda che sono Quindi non è detto che poi arrivi magari anche alla conoscenza del tipo, <ride> del tipo da, da, come lo consideravamo. The building type. <ride> del type, esatto. Sì, ma ammettiamo che ci arrivi. Cosa, ah, cosa che... cambia? Eh beh, nel momento in cui io ho la conoscenza di un knowledge così profondo posso lavorare sul piano simbolico e culturale quindi non sul piano numerico di dell'organizzazione di una struttura ma io lavoro sul piano che è quello che sostanzialmente avviene già in luce in una search su Google perché Google il search interno è semantico se voi battete, mi mettete una parola e lui vi trova delle parole che non sono plurale al singolare della stessa sono semanticamente connesse nella rete che significa. Sì, sì, che, che è però costruito sulla base di un di una database, di un corpus di, di traduzioni già fatte, di associazioni già verificate, machine learning. Mm, Parsi, nel senso mm. che per esempio il translate di Google è, non è stato scritto, è, stato, è un sistema che è andato a prendere è un archivio, è un archivio. Mm. Sì. e a costruire le referenze per i diversi sistemi. Ogni traduzione che ci viene data da Google è una traduzione che è già stata fatta. Però questo non basta, perché bisogna ancora scegliere le buone e le cattive. Quello è un sistema di reward che si fa con machine learning, per cui fra tutte le traduzioni già fatte ce ne sono alcune che salgono nella scala perché sono premiate o rewarded, è un, è un trial and error. Fra tutte le soluzioni già fatte ce ne sono alcune che vengono scaltate e altre che vengono ritenute. Ma è ben più rispetto a... Ma è proprio così che funziona. Sì, sì, sì. Stiamo andando verso una rappresentazione profonda del knowledge e cosa diavolo sia il knowledge lo scopriremo perché nel momento in cui tu lo, lo inizi a modellare a modellizzare 
scopri anche che cos'è. Ma rimane comunque una differenza fondamentale fra ciò che si sa della nostra scienza e quel meccanismo che quello è sempre basato su un'accumulazione di informazione che è senza rapporto con quello che noi possiamo ricordare. Cioè la nostra intelligenza è sempre fondata sulla capacità di sintetizzare e di semplificare, perché non possiamo fare una ricerca su 40.000 milioni di miliardi di traduzioni già fatte, quindi possiamo solo ricordarne alcune che abbiamo già selezionato. Questa è la differenza fondamentale. Small data for us, big data for them. Quando un computer vince giocando una partita a scacchi è perché ha in archivio tutte le partite a scacchi già giocate e quindi vedendo sulla scacchiera una determinata configurazione un gran maestro di scacchi di quelli umani dirà questa è la partita Karpov-Spassky del 17 ottobre 1962, se se ne ricorda. Ma il computer ricorderà tutte le partite importanti che sono già giocate. E quando non trova una partita già giocata, con simulazione, ci arriverà comunque. Solo che se la partita è già stata giocata, può anche sapere chi l'ha già vinta. E in questo, modo, in questo modo vincono contro di noi, ricordando tutte le partite già giocate, ciò che noi non possiamo fare. Almeno, così me l'hanno raccontata, perché... <ride> Attica, forza brutta del tappeto. Forza brutta, sì, forza brutta, sì, 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 sì. E sì. è un bilanciamento del tuo. Sì, sì, sì. Parmi in italiano? Certo. E, no, c'è ancora un'osservazione su, su uh, Data for Them, Sport and Data for Us. Mi uh, pare interessante quanto ti ho detto rispetto alla il fatto che ci sono comunque ancora luoghi di interazione, uomo uomo, di interazione faccia a faccia, eh, dove eh, il fatto che non capiamo la lingua del computer no? non costituisce un problema. Però costituisce un problema il fatto che questi luoghi sono i meno rilevanti socialmente per noi. Mi spiego. Uh, come mostra che ne so, di erenza, non tanto per il problema. Noi facciamo uso della rule of thumb. Uh, quasi sempre, una strana cosa che è il caso della nostra interazione quotidiana, quando interagiamo con quelle 10-20 persone che costituiscono famiglie e sociali, e c'è le commissi, sono stati programmati biologicamente a sostenere un motivo per agire in quel modo, e c'è le commissi. Funziona così anche l'interazione al massimo livello, cioè i grandi decisori, i strateghi, sia nel campo delle imprese private che nel campo della strategia militare, ragionano anche in te, perché la stragrande maggioranza degli studi democratici cosa fanno gli anni decisori ci mostrano questo gli anni 60 e 90 questi signori appunto non potendo processare gli anni di vita di lavoro vanno a naso perché infatti sono lì per questo sono lì perché si è visto che questi signori e quello che dice questo è il metodo di Donald Trump tanto che poi gli altri limiteranno quando il grande investitore fa un investimento ma se ha fatto lui diciamo che no ma lui perché ha fatto questo perché processa più informazioni del no semplicemente perché come la gente militare, che Napoleone dice le guerre di Nova alla Russia, ma perché era però che ci ha azzeccato. Ecco, questo aspetto mi pare interessante dal punto di vista politico, nel senso che eh, nell'interazione quotidiana ci comportiamo come ci siamo stati abituati a comportarci, no, da 190 mila anni, tant'è, da due anni di Sapiens, ma anche, anche a grandi livelli, a grandi decisioni, che fanno uso di corsa e non tengono conto di quei grandi dati che comunque servono in, come dire, in quei quattro quinti delle interazioni sociali per invece processare informazioni in grazie a tutti Ma non sarà che i grandi decisori possono applicare questo livello di capacità di sintesi intuitiva su una massa di dati che è già stata preselezionata per cui loro possono agire avendo un repertorio di informazioni che è più vasto di quello che potrebbe avere il signor Albara all'angolo della strada? Sì, però non sono macchine, sono comunque persone che comunque appuntano un altro cioè uno può decidere a naso se ha questa capacità sì. intuitiva, però il grande decisore può decidere a naso su, decis su informazioni che sono già state sapientemente selezionate prima di essermi presentate. Quasi sempre mm. non le analizzo, quasi sempre non le analizzo. Ah. Caso più esemplare, ho studiato, ho citato quello che sono le più finanziarie, finanziari, sono in Latina, naturalmente, no? i grandi decisori della Riserva Americana, no? ricevono una sintesi di tutti i dati possibili dell'andamento economia, hanno in mano qualcosa, però tanto gli immobili e il corpo, ma si è mai visto che l'immobile è l'ordine? E poi c'è stata la fine. Eh, per, in quel caso si... Sì, è sbagliato perché... 
Ha sbagliato lui però, non perché le informazioni fossero più o meno giuste o sbagliate, non le guarda. C'è un pregiudizio che dice ma i dati Ma nel caso delle decisioni che fanno ad esempio gli ingegneri nel caso del calcolo di una struttura, si possono con gli strumenti normali ottimizzare solo strutture molto semplici. Nel caso di una struttura complicata, anche tradizionale, c'è un'intuizione, l'ingegnere ha l'idea che quella è la struttura migliore e poi uno stuolo di suoi eh, assistenti fa tutti i calcoli e si prova che quella struttura probabilmente funzionerà e ne possono provare tradizionalmente, fino a vent'anni fa, ne possono provare 5, 6, 7 e in base a quell'intuizione di base provano un numero limitato di varianti e poi sceglieranno fra quelle 5 o 6 la migliore. Ora, con i sistemi di simulazione di cui ho parlato brevemente, a partire da quell'intuizione di base si possono calcolare 4 milioni di miliardi di varianti. Ciò che vuol dire che l'intuizione di base non è più tanto determinante, perché se è sbagliata la verifica è immediata. Quindi in un certo senso il genio dell'intuizione, che alcuni hanno e altri non hanno, è meno determinante perché possiamo fare così tante verifiche così rapidamente. E possiamo al limite fare così tante verifiche at random su un campionario di variazioni eh, che al limite si potrebbe partire senza nessuna intuizione. In realtà è sempre meglio partire con una prima intuizione, altrimenti non sappiamo da dove partire e poi ottimizzarla. Però in teoria si potrebbe partire con una scatola di cartone e dando al computer un po' di tempo troverebbe comunque non la soluzione migliore, ma una soluzione abbastanza buona. In questo senso il talento intuitivo che Nervi aveva e l'ingegnere all'angolo della strada probabilmente non aveva è meno determinante ora, perché possiamo fare così tante prove che possiamo eliminare l'ispirazione creatrice che fino a una data recente era l'unico punto di partenza che avevamo. Sì, però Questa capacità di calcolo comunque insomma, possiamo disporre, non serve un po' questo. Ma penso che nel caso della guerra i war games abbiano già capacità di simulazioni molto elevate, non lo so, non è il mio campo. Per cui immagino che l'intuizione del signor X che dice possiamo vincere la guerra contro il Venezuela molto rapidamente, poi magari i suoi esperti al Pentagono gli diranno ma forse la verifica forse si può fare più facilmente ora di quanto non si sarebbe fatto vent'anni fa. Comprese la verifica vuol dire provare 4 milioni di minime varianti, perché le variazioni che si provano con questi programmi di ottimizzazione sono sempre incrementali. Quindi variazioni at random di piccoli parametri, però si prova che a un certo punto quel parametro sembra dare risultati promettenti. Quindi i programmi di machine learning sanno a quel punto come focalizzarsi su quella variazione che sembra più promettente, eccetera, eccetera, ad libitum ad quad infinitum. Però non, non si sa mai dove e quando si finisce. Neanche, quel, neanche quelli che li usano. Neanche quelli che li usano. Per cui io posso applicare un'analisi tecnica che va a cercare, in realtà non mi spiega niente di perché il dollaro e l'euro scambiano in un certo modo, ma riconoscere i pattern che ha già, perché ha analizzato un sacco di dati rispetto a come sono avvenute e quindi sa che magari se ci sono quelle tal modifiche gli scambi automatici porteranno magari a quella piccola versione. Ma siamo sempre nel campo del piccolo. Quando però c'è l'evento imprevisto, diciamo, quello che cambia radicalmente il trend, quello non è una cosa che riguarda i pubblicati, perché non è una cosa che si verifica costantemente. Quindi non ha dati abbastanza da renderlo previsionale. Dovrebbero essere magari pensato con... No, questi meccanismi funzionano solo per minime funzionano variazioni per incrementali. La catastrofe, non, si, la catastrofe non, non è prevista da questi sistemi, si può modellizzare una catastrofe, ma il sistema non ci arriva mai da solo, perché il sistema è, è quasi leibniziano, non facit saltum, è sempre per...
Storicamente possiamo già dire che negli anni 90 siamo stati migliori, cioè certe interpretazioni del paradigma digitale siamo stati noi, gli architetti e i designer, le design professions, a inventarli e adesso tutti le hanno mutuate e non riconoscono neanche il debito, non è che ci creditino in una nota a pie pagina dicendo queste idee le ha avute Bernard Cash nel 1993, ma in realtà noi sappiamo che sono venute da noi, da certe scuole di architettura, adesso si leggono nei libri di economia, la London School of Economics, la Harvard Business School, ma questi paradigmi sono tutti stati, per noi è, è roba vecchia, sono cose che sappiamo da vent'anni. Quindi possiamo già celebrare il fatto che vent'anni fa siamo stati migliori, siamo ancora i migliori adesso, questo si potrà dire solo fra vent'anni, però evidentemente nelle scuole di architettura il paradigma è già cambiato, perché ehm, il paradigma della continuità del digital streamlining, che era ancora dominante fino a qualche anno fa, non è più il paradigma dominante nelle scuole di avanguardia, c'è un, una nuova tendenza che è quella del discrete, discretization, um, fare tutto per piccoli cubi, voxels, eccetera, eccetera, e anche l'idea del, um, uh, come dire, um, sono sistemi discreti, cioè il passaggio dai sistemi continui ai sistemi discreti che al limite riporta anche certi meccanismi di prefabbricazione pesante, perché il sistema discreto vuol dire che un certo cubetto può essere ripetuto molte volte e allora uno potrebbe dire perché non sfruttare le economie di scala? Non potremmo dire perché abbiamo già provato vent'anni fa che non, non servono e che non ci sono più, però eh, questo discorso sta ritornando. Questo però in un quadro in cui l'innovazione tecnologica è meno importante nelle scuole di architettura ora di quanto non lo fosse 15 anni fa. Cioè eh, la, il discorso tecnologico che era dominante negli anni 90 per vari motivi sociali, tecnologici e storici e ora meno importante nel contesto culturale generale, però in questo ambito ristretto penso che stiamo ancora, forse, trovando qualcosa di nuovo. If I only knew. Uh, the social reality. Yes. Is it the uh, dimension we can consider as a legal automata or not? And if it is not completely automatic, because it's, it's, a, it's a mixed uh, actor network of actors, of subjective actors which have intentions, and let's say automata, which do not have intention to do this. How do we manage this situation as, as architects? Because are you asking if human beings are endowed with free will? <laughs> no, human beings are. Human beings as, as free will. So uh, it's a paradoxical question. So I think that it is not uh, automatic, of course. But at the same time, it's kind of an extension of the automatic dimension for the, this second digital term, this sort of parallel artificial intelligence, let's say, this huge power of uh, uh, machines who can combine the computational strategies, uh, in, also to the light of, of this kind of discussion we have, it seems sometimes that we are, we are pushed out of our role because there is the machines it's all, almost designed for us. But if I think about the strategy, This is the mm -hmm. key word. Uh, the, the Maybe we are, uh, we, we are designing strategies, mostly. Even But more than that's our job, yes. buildings. Mm -hmm. so a design is a strategy, it's not a building. By definition, it's paper. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> exactly. 
So, uh, if we use uh, the, the, the machines for predicting all the automatic uh, parts of components, implications of an ongoing process, and at the same time we accept that we will never, we never predict intentional acts. Maybe we can think about a different way of considering our role as architects. We will design a different architecture, which is not about the architecture of things, not specifically because we even pick up yeah, but what, what you say is, of course, a good point, but it pertains to the permanent paradox of the architectural or the design profession. Computers are not going to change that game. Meaning that a design is, by definition, a prefiguration of something which we expect will happen, as we notated it, but we know full well in advance that will never happen exactly the way it designed, because there is this jump, leap in the dark, this, you know, black sea between intention and fabrication, which computers to some extent have facilitated, but the gap still exists. And so um, the fact that there is a more effective tool to bridge the gap between notation and fabrication is probably a minor quantitative change in a profession which is by definition predicated upon this ontological paradox. We conceive of something which we expect at some point will happen, but we never know. Yes. And computers are, where they can give a cosmetic appearance with simulation, but we are in full control. But when we are a true and honest professional, we know that that is not the case. So uh, computers are not going to make that even, either better or worse than it always was. And this game of the profession is not going to change significantly. Well. It does change in the instrumentality, but not in the intentionality. Maybe one last question. Uh, thank you for your speech and for keeping us up to date. We are always late at the back. No, you keep me up to date. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would like to ask you um, if it is still viable um, an idea of a divided authorship, or if authorship is not correct an idea of different levels of design and uh, as to say that uh, even if the low level, the low level in computer science terms, the low level of, the, of designing is uh, no more designing a general function and, and if the architect has uh, a different designing goal than uh, that of uh, an interactor, a customer. Yes, yes, that's that's the theory of a split agency, as I call it, 10 years ago. But I didn't invent this idea. This idea was invented by literary critics and uh, theoreticians of video gaming. And they took the video game as a metaphor of the new dimension of agency or authorship in the digital domain. The video game design, the video game player is the author of a game in the sense that each game you play is different from any other, but always within the ambit of the rules of the game that you cannot change. To some extent, parametricism as a tool of design is exactly the same game. A parametric script has by definition variability of parameters. So there is a primary author or a primary designer who does a certain level of script. But this is never complete by definition because someone else, an interactor, will tweak some parameters and so they keep playing the game. This is the general technical logic of all digital tools. From a video phone, from a, a smartphone to you know, parametric system, they all work that way. We may be more or less alert to the way it works, but even when we do not notice, it is always working that way. So we cannot avoid it. We can bring it to a higher level of you know, awareness. But all digital tools, by definition, work that way. There is always a degree of fluidity in the sense that someone else can take the same script and tweak some parameters and use 99% of what we already scripted and still tweak the remaining 1%, which will make, if necessary, a family of objects which are completely different. And whether we like it or not, this is the spirit of the game.
Well, it depends on which level you want to play the game. That's your choice as a designer. Some choose to become, you know, computer scientists and they do actual script. Some just take the box and they use it to design. What's that? <laughs> Questo sembra drastico. <ride> Comunque la risposta era finita. Io volevo solo mettere il mio intervento e ringraziarti tantissimo per questa bellissima discussione che hai scatenato. Hai usato una parola che per me è molto importante, memoria. E credo che la parola memoria sia qualcosa che potremmo riprendere a partire dalla tua analisi di questo secondo cambiamento uh, del digitale. Perché credo che quella continuità che l'architetto produce in questi cambiamenti sia anche in qualche modo legata al fatto che quell'artigiano di cui tu parli no? è un artigiano che ha sempre usato la memoria sì. per produrre, la memoria produttiva. Allora, i sistemi di memoria, la memoria continua, fanno parte del nostro modo e continuo. Poi albertiano e post albertiano, se vogliamo dire, usare i, i tuoi elementi importanti e scientifici. Quindi credo che la similitudine della memoria, quello che ci ha insegnato oggi, è anche che ciò che è nuovo è anche ciò che è antico, continuamente Ma in, in questo è caso è ancora più drastico, perché più computation è nuovo, più in un certo senso è antico. Mm. Molto <laughs> 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 <laughs>